<laughs> Eric. Hi, Charles. How you doing? Good. So we're finally in your real office as opposed to a conference room or Denmark That's or true. somewhere else. Yep. So uh, what's your story? Let's tell us a little about. We had you a lot on Channel Nine, but we've never really talked about like your past, your history, why you're working at Microsoft, what exactly you do. I mean, people can infer that you're a language guy, but let's talk a little bit about you from a you know personal level, uh, professional level before we dig into some functional programming stuff. Okay, good. Well, so yeah, I'm, I started Microsoft uh, around 2000 um, uh -huh. and I was working with um, James Plamondon, who was an evangelist at that time. Uh -huh. um, do you know him? I don't know him, but okay. he's an evangelist. So. Yes, yeah, well, and he's doing some interesting stuff now with uh, some re revolutionary new musical instrument, the tummer, but you know, that's it. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, um, so this was at the time that the CLR was still kind of you know a secret project. So what they were looking for was people, um, language guys, that would kind of you know try out the CLR to see if it was really a common language runtime. Okay. Um, so I was involved in Haskell and functional programming at that time, and so um, together with Simon Peyton Jones of Microsoft Research, we kind of got involved. Um, and trying to see if we could port Haskell um, to the CLR. Huh. Um, and then my graduate student, Dan Leyen, who is now in Microsoft Research, did um, Visual Studio integration for um, Haskell. And that's kind of, I think, still part of the Visual Studio SDK, uh, mm -hmm. the, the stuff that he wrote, kind of managed wrapper for that. So, but let's, let's be clear here, because I know Niners have asked about this in the past. So there, there actually is a Haskell.net? Well, there, there, um, there were many kind of attempts to do Haskell.net. Um, actually, also, I did uh, a couple of Haskell to Java uh, uh, translations. Oh. Uh, um, but um, there, is, uh, uh, there were a couple of attempts, but never kind of really um, something, you know, kind of product quality. Um, Nigel Perry, who actually now also worked for Microsoft, um, worked on that for a while. Um, but after we did, I did Haskell. Um, I said I thought Haskell was too big, so we, I worked on a scripting language called Mondrian, mm. um, and this was way before people were talking about dynamic languages and scripting languages and languages for for the CLR. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was kind of the first dynamic, purely functional scripting language for the CLR. Wow! So if you go to my homepage, there's still kind of a link to to that. Um, but anyway. So uh, at some point I thought, you know, it might be better to try and do this all, you know, for real. So that's when I moved to Microsoft. Okay. And joined like a real product team. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, when you're, when you're <laughs> academic, right, it's like, it's like your papers are like write only. Um, sure. You write your papers and there are very few people that read them and you, the impact is very little. Hmm. Um, so I wanted to make my hands dirty. The other thing, and I often joke about that, I felt like a vegetarian butcher, so I was teaching software engineering, uh -huh. but I had no no clue what I was teaching about because I never wrote kind of you know really big programs and I never really experienced how people really build software. So it was really kind of like theory, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't feel that I was really teaching my students anything useful. Interesting. And so you came to Microsoft to work on real products. Yes. Some of those, of course, being, I mean, you're well known for the work that you've done in C Sharp and, of course, VB. Um, were you involved with F Sharp at all? I was uh, not really directly involved with F Sharp. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, I, I'm, I know Don Syme and the rest of the Cambridge people very well. Yeah. Um, I uh, wrote the F Sharp, the foreword for the F Sharp book. Um, and so, yes, uh, I mean, uh, cool. So, I mean, one of the questions I would ask is, you know, why did you get involved? What is it about languages? I mean, why, why did you decide to go the languages route? I mean, you could have went the systems route, how systems work. Why did you go languages? Yeah, so, so there's an interesting history about that. When I was in, in uh, university in, in 81, um, I, I was not very, we had to kind of write programs for IBM 370 assembler and, and, and PDP 11 assembler. Mm -hmm. And I was not, that didn't really excite me. So I was spending all my days kind of hacking 
So and and I'm not I'm not talking here about the good kind of hacking, but the kind of the real kind of trying to break into the systems and so on. <laughs> you were a hacker. Huh? I was a hacker. Yes, oh, yes, man. yes. So um, uh, as you can say, my grades were kind of you know going downhill and so on. And then um, uh, Professor Boete, Raymond Boete, he's now in Belgium in Ghent. He showed me something interesting. He gave me a flyer from the Japanese fifth generation project. And he gave me a, a, a paper about implementing functional languages using um, SKI combinators. Um, and that kind of caught my attention. So, um, so the, the, the thing with the Japanese fifth generation thing was Prolog. So um, I was playing a lot of backgammon these days, you know, backgammon gambling, you know, we were drinking beer, you know what yeah, happens in, in the dorm rooms renegade, here. Yeah. Yes. Um, so then my first product program was a backgammon uh, program, uh, I mm. kind of, you know, that was my first try. And then, um, but I think with Prolog, I, it really didn't stick with me because Prolog feels like very declarative. But in order to write real programs, you have to use what they call cuts. So that has to limit the backtracking. And then you really have to understand the operational nature of things. Mm. Um, but I got really kind of hooked on functional programming. This was a language called Cecil, um, developed by David Turner. Okay. Um, and that was like, you know, the magic of that was that it was a very simple language, very powerful, used lazy evaluation and so on. But it compiled all these functional programs to just three basic functions. So imagine that you take you know, an arbitrary program and compile it to a computer that has just three instructions. Mm. And that kind of fascinated me. I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of an extremist, so everything that's kind of, you know, that kind of crazy you know, appeals to me. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you've been doing a lot of that lately. Yep. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, functional programming. And I know that we keep kind of harping on this because it's starting to become more popular now, Yep. Uh, primarily because of the many core problem. You feel yep. that with functional programming it's easier for you guys to be able to compile the mess away from developers. Um, but I would ask this, uh, do you think there's a reason why imperative languages, C++, C Sharp, Java, VB, these are the popular languages of the day? So why is that the case? And why do you think that people are going to want to change? I mean, could it be that, that that's just the natural selection of programming languages, that C++ won the Darwinian fight for successful programming language? I mean, would you argue that that's the case? Or are you, are you going to say that, that companies are pushing stuff on people. And let's talk about that, because yeah. I know you're a, a big fan of functional programming. Well, to, to be honest, I'm also a big fan of imperative programming. Okay. So the thing is, in my view, there's kind of, you know, and again, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of an extremist, um, but there, there are only, there are kind of two optimum solutions here. It's like either you embrace state and, and effects, in which case you end up with an imperative language and, and in particular with an object or a language because that's kind of, you know, where you encapsulate state and behavior in kind of, you know, nicely packaged uh, components. Mm -hmm. Or you go all the, to the other extreme and you say, I kind of embrace purity. And that's where you end up with a language like Haskell. Um, but I, I don't believe there's there's much kind of in between. I don't know if you remember um, <laughs> um, the uh, the interview we did with Simon in Cambridge. Of course I do. Okay, so Are you kidding me? Yes. Yeah, so let me kind of remind you know people about what we're. Uh, oh, I should kind of draw this a little bit higher so I'm cool. going sure. to stand up here. Of course. So what we did is we had these kind of two axes here where we said here this is useful versus useless. Uh huh. And this time I will say this is like you know what for me is useful is that. This is used for software um, that makes money, right? I mean, that's what, what you were kind of implying too, right? These okay. successful languages, they're used to build products that make lots of money. Okay. Um, C++ is definitely here. Um, and then here, this is kind of, you know, pure, impure versus pure. So let me give it like a diamond. It's like, you know, the rating for, for hotels, you know, this is like four diamonds. And here it's like, you know, super, the looks and this is kind of you know grungy okay and um, so C++ here makes lots of money it's kind of impure Haskell nobody makes money here with Haskell um, but it's kind of you know really luxurious and pure this okay. was the, the Nirvana 
Which would be a great name for a programming language. That would be a great name, yes. Okay. Maybe I should start working on that. <laughs> and now, of course, you know, if we, if we look here, and this is kind of tongue-in-cheek, of course, mm -hmm. but here are like, you know, and, and, and I should, well, I, I want to do, make it black and white. You know, I could kind of move them a little bit Fair around, enough. but let me just be completely black and white. Here's like, you know, I would say here, you know, um, no, not even here. I would put VB here, C sharp here, mm -hmm. F sharp here, Java here. You know, so they are impure and they are not really, you know, people are making some money with it, but mm -hmm. not as much as with, C++. with unmanaged code, but sure. uh, C++. So there's a kind of a little bit of spread, but I just want to kind of keep things um, in the quadrants just to be okay. um, a little bit kind of clear. Now sure. the thing is, this was the kind of picture that we had on the board. And this one is empty, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is, what I want to kind of add here too is a third axis here. And here I want to say honest versus dishonest. Mm -hmm. So here's like which languages are honest and dishonest. So dishonest is the smiley face? Um, no, no, no. This oh. is dishonest okay. and this is Got honest. It. So honest is, is where the type system tells you exactly what's going on. So, mm. for example, in Haskell, when you look at the types, and we will talk about that later, hopefully, it's like the types tell you what effects or what side effects you're programming. So it's pure, but it's more than pure, because if you're only a pure language, you cannot do anything. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the, the world is not pure. If, if you're drinking your coffee, you know, your cup empties, so you have to deal with impurities. So Haskell, you know, is... Uh, allows you to do with side effects, but it's very kind of you know honest about it. So so kind of Haskell is really here, hmm. and then I'm not very good in drawing 3D pictures. No, actually that works. That's good. Okay, good. Okay. So now here are dynamically typed languages like Python and Ruby and Smalltalk, and maybe you know some of them might might be kind of up there because they make money, but I, I'm not so sure. But the thing is here, they say, well, we're completely dynamically typed, so there is we don't give you any guarantees about the type, so we don't even mention them. And I mm. think that's honest too. Okay. The problem is with the kind of languages that are in this quadrant here, that are kind of, you know, dishonest. And what do I mean with dishonest? Yes. Let's talk about yes. that. So with this honest, I mean that if you see a function like, you know, int f, and I look at the signature here. Mm -hmm. Now the type system tells me that this returns an int. Yes. Okay. But this might be a function that reads the, 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 the number of seconds on the clock. So every time I call this function, it gives me a different number. Okay. okay? So in that sense, it's dishonest because it tells me it gives me an int, but it doesn't re really. It gives me something a changing int. Mm -hmm. Okay. In Haskell, the type of that would be I/O of int, which means this is not an int, but this is something that gives a side effect, and as a result of the side effect, gives you an int. So the kind of thing in the in the side effect, you know, mm -hmm. in the type, it tells you that the side effect. So let me tell you here where I should put um, Java actually in here too. And that's an interesting observation. Okay, and why is it there? So Java um, has something that's called, you know, you have to write, in the signature of a Java program you write which exceptions are thrown by this method. The, the, the throws, throws clause. Absolutely. Okay, because exceptions are a form of effects. Okay. So in Java you have to specify, you know, you say whatever here and then you say throws, you know, and then you list the exceptions. So it is honest about what's happening. Okay, the, the first thing I'd interject there okay. is it's very easy to be dishonest in the sense that you could just throw exception. So if you're a developer and you're not exactly sure what you're going to throw or you don't want to deal with having to say, I'm going to throw this, this, and this, you can just say throws exception because things are derived from exception in Java. Yep. Right? Yep. Or throws whatever all exceptions are derived from. So. That's a way to be dishonest. Yes, but at least it's a, it's more honest than kind of saying nothing, right? Saying I'm returning an integer where this thing might always throw an exception and never return an integer. Okay, fair enough. So 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 again, there's always kind of you know a gliding scale here between you know honesty and dishonesty. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I, I think you know again by making this kind of black and white, 
I, I think you, you, you should get kind of a better feeling of that. But, Absolutely. But, but this thing is, I think, you know, the main thing about um, what I like, oh, what I like about Haskell yeah. is that it's kind of both pure and honest. So it's kind of, you know, this is like the poster child of, of programming, right? He's like, you know. Cool. And so today, Eric, what I really would like to do, because we've spent, you know, on Channel 9, and with you and others, yep. a hell of a lot of time on imperative languages and what's new in C Sharp and et cetera, et cetera, yep. which is wonderful stuff. Let's focus today on your extreme, yep. right? Like really what is functional programming? What's going on in Haskell? And let's talk about why you like it so much. Okay. Okay? Yep. Let's do that. So we have, this is a great overview, and I think everybody out there is, is clear where we're, where we're going now. Okay. Cool. So, so let, let's kind of, you know, look at, at, at this a little bit. Um, so if you look at what is functional programming about, there's a paper by John Hughes. It's called Why Functional Programming Matters. This is a paper from 1984. Okay. Um, and the paper kind of really explains very well what functional programming is. What you see often people saying right now, and when you, you mention like, oh, functional programming is getting buzzed, mm -hmm. is that functional programming is about programming without using side effects. Okay. Um, I think that's kind of wrong. I think mm. functional programming is about two things. It's about, well, about really one thing. It's about programming using functions, okay? And there's a very clear definition. I saw some um, in Redmond developer news, you know, mm. there was a paper about um, functional programming and, and, and the author said, you know, there's not really a, a very precise definition of functional programming. I think for functional programming, that definition is easy. Programming with mathematical functions. Hmm. So what is a mathematical function? Yes. Well, a mathematical function is something that, you know, takes, you know, let's write a function here, f, that takes an int and returns a bool. Now, one of the properties of a function is that whenever you supply it with the same argument, it returns the same result. Okay? Which means that if I call f of 3, and I call f of 3 again, and I say, I, and I put them in a pair. Mm -hmm. Each time, because it's a function, this returns the same value. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Which means that I can just now say let x equals f of three in x comma x. So I can lift out this common expression here because I know that every time I execute it, it will give me the same result. Interesting. Okay. And uh -huh. now the thing is that. If this would be, and now I'm, I'm going to change the signature here to write it more in kind of, you know, in, per, in, in standard form. If this is a function, oh, to return to bool, function and method, and then took an int, okay. Mm -hmm. The thing is that um, this guy, again, is like, you know, it, it doesn't tell me that this thing returns a, a, a boolean every time. And, and so I cannot do this kind of, you know, transformations because it might be, again, the, the example, right, this might give me the, the, the times on a clock and mm -hmm. now whenever I, I evaluate this, now here I will get the same time, but here depending on how long it takes, you know, to, to do this, mm -hmm. it will give me two different times. So this mm -hmm. might evaluate to, um, okay, this is 25 seconds. And it took a little bit of time to write it down, so I look now again, and it's 35 seconds. Okay, okay so this e executing this thing will return in this, and in this case, it will be 40. And now, if I substitute this, this will be 40, 40, right? Because the x doesn't change. Got it. So, so this is kind of the, the big difference between pure functional programming and non pure functional programming. So, a functional program is a function where that whenever you give it the same argument, it will return the same result. And, and the nice thing is that I can now always look at sub-expressions and replace them by their definition and, and, and fold things. So, but, I mean, this is definitely a cause for concern, uh, uh, confusion in the sense that if I have a method in C-sharp that says, yep. I take an int, I take that int, and I add it to 5, and yep. I return the result. Yep. Every single time that you give me the same int, and let's say I pass in three every single time, yes. I'm going to get eight. Yes. Eight, 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 so, eight, eight. Yep. So why is that uh, something that is of concern? Okay, so now let, let's look at this. Re this is a very good question. You say, 
You said I take it. I added three, right? Or a three or a five? Yeah. Oh, okay. five. Okay. So this and this returned an end. So yeah. this is an example in C sharp that is a function, right? Because every time I return, um, it returns the same thing. Now let yeah. me, you know, do this. Int f int x and return x plus and let me say uh, let me say let have a, a random uh -huh. that returns you know an int got right? it yeah now the thing is that this guy has the same signature right it says it takes an int returns an int mm -hmm. but this time whenever i call it with the same argument it will return me a different result so this is a dishonest Absolutely. function because it tells me it returns an int but it returns me a changing int and i cannot now whenever i see f of three comma f of three mm -hmm. i cannot replace that by you know i cannot lift out this common sub expression cool okay. so now you're saying that in functional programming like in haskell i can't use that the, the concept of random in a function okay that's a very good question so let, let me kind of turn this question slightly around cool Okay. Now the thing is, what if you now say we we cannot have side effects? Mm -hmm. Okay, because this is a side effect. This function random has a side effect. Okay. So now, if you want to say let's make, um, let's remove um, side effects from the language, which means that we cannot use random anymore. Okay. It means that we cannot use exceptions anymore. Hmm. It means we cannot use threads anymore. Hmm. It means we cannot use I.O. anymore. Console.write line is a side effect. So the only thing we can do is, is very <laughs> simple things. We cannot have instance variables anymore. Hmm. So it means that we cannot have, we cannot do any kind of object-oriented programming. Hmm. Um, and what you end up with is like, you know, a language in which you cannot really do anything. I cannot even print stuff on the, I cannot read anything. I can, <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, um, well, yeah. It's so pure, it's useless. Exactly. Uh -huh. It's like muted, yeah. right? <laughs> um, and that is, is, is kind of the problem. When people yeah. say, um, let's remove side effects, if you take that to the extreme, you end up with a useless language. And Haskell in the early days was a useless language too. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, um, um, the way, now how do you do I.O.? Yes. Right? So how do you interact with the environment? So. In the early Haskell implementations, we used to have what we call um, stream I.O. Okay. So your Haskell program would be structured as a function that would take a stream of responses and would generate a stream of requests. It's like a little bit like HTTP protocol, right? Where you kind of you know, send a request to the operating system and this was the OS, and the OS gets a request from the Haskell program and returns a response, and the Haskell program would get a response and create a request. Okay. But now you see here that there's a cycle, right? Because these things are kind of mutually recursive. Hmm. And that's kind of, so it was really easy to write programs that would deadlock, that would kind of, you know, instead of, I already deadlocked when I said this, because the Haskell program doesn't get a response, now it must first create a request and then wait for the response. So writing these programs is very um, error prone. But the thing is, now this guy is pure, right? Because it's just a function that takes a stream of re responses mm -hmm. and creates a stream of requests. Okay. And now you can embed this inside uh, the operating system. Um, so if you would make, say, C sharp completely pure, you would have to do something like this too. So main, instead of being void, and the, well, main is kind of half like that, right? It takes the, the arguments, you know, the command line arguments, but it returns void. But every function now would take, you know, a list of responses and creates a, a list of requests. Interesting. And this didn't work, but it was all pure, so it was kind of hard to use. So now the question is, how do you deal with side effects? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is where this kind of word monad comes in. Sure. Um, but it's kind of, in some sense, it's just being honest about your types. It's like in Java, the, the throws class. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing, you know, read line, this is a good example. If this is a function read line, and let me just use kind of Haskell notation here. What is the type of this? Well, this thing takes unit, so it takes no argument. And it doesn't return a string. 
right? Because each time I call read line, mm -hmm. it returns a different thing. Mm -hmm. So it would be otherwise dishonest if I would say it returns a string, because then that would mean I can, everywhere where I say read line unit, I could just replace it by the previous value. Okay. So in Haskell, it returns this. It returns IO of string, which means this is a side effect side effect in computation that returns a string. Mm. So it's like the throws clause in Java, this tells you, you know, it doesn't just return a string, but it does some work and then returns a string. Okay. So now, how can you explain that guy? Mm -hmm. um, and th there's a kind of an interesting um, explanation of that. So just as I showed you how you could do kind of stream-based I.O., yeah. now uh, l l let me give you an example of, of um, what people do to make things kind of, you know, pure. Because mm -hmm. in, in order to make things pure, you have to be explicit about everything. Um, so let's look at um, system.daytime.ticks. Okay. Okay, and I will just um, abbreviate that as ticks. So currently, you know, ticks has type ticks and it takes a, and it returns a long. Okay. Oh, let me say, I have a, yeah. no, I, this is okay. I have a long. No, it's a, it's a static variable, sure. This is, you know, I, I should, I, I was kind of going too fast. Okay. So, this is, this is a static variable, system.datetime.ticks, and it has type long. Okay. But the thing is, every time I look at this thing, it gives me a different value. Mm -hmm. So, I cannot say, you know, let x equals ticks in x comma x, right? This is the kind of example that I used before. Okay. So now what people do is they say, okay, well, since this guy kind of is evaluated here, but it should not, right? Because it should get a different value in these cases. What they do instead is they say, let's make this guy into a lambda expression. And now this is fine. So this looks maybe a little bit weird, but this lambda expression is kind of already a value, so I can execute it once, mm -hmm. and now you know I, I can duplicate it here. Interesting. Um, but of course, this has solved half of your problem because if I now really want to have the value of ticks, I still have to call it, right? Because it's now a lambda expression, hmm. and now I see this duplication here again. Well, but now I want to say you know let, um, well I want to kind of lift that out. So I want to write something like, you know, let y equals in y comma y. So I not, have not really solved the problem because now this guy is kind of, you know, duplicated and, and you get the same mm -hmm. result. So, so this kind of trick doesn't really work. Okay. So what people then do is to say, well, you know, this guy must be a function that takes the the state of the world, okay, okay, and I don't have to put brackets here. And what it returns, it, it returns the pair of ticks and the world. Hmm. Okay, because after I've looked at the ticks, the world has changed. So this is like a token that I can pass around. Mm -hmm. And now what you have to do now is in order to 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 um, use this, and this is a little bit hard in, to write in C-sharp because you don't have kind of pattern matching. I'm using here kind of some, some fantasy here where I return a pair. Mm -hmm. You have to write things like this. I have to write, you know, here like, you know, say I have a function f that I have to pass in the world now, and then in here you have to say, you know, world prime x, comma world prime equals, you know, um, it's called an X, and I have to pass that world in here. So and now this gets a new world, and now I can say ticks new prime equals X. So you have to kind of you have to thread the world through your program, and now it's kind of pure because each of these things are now you know is is effect free because in order to execute something, I have to pass it the state of the world. Um, <laughs> yes, and that that's okay. good. And, and, but that's kind of really, if, if you're taking this purity to the extreme is what happens, mm -hmm. right? Every, every time somebody wants to change something, they must have access to the whole state, every state, and then you can kind of pass it around. So you're doing a lot of copying. 
Well, the, but the thing is, you you don't have to do copying. This is really just to make sure that it's kind of single threaded, that okay. kind of side effects kind of you know get get observed correctly. But there's no concept of, of shared state, right? There's no global variable. Well, this is the kind of global variable because the thing is, the problem is, if you want to be pure, you cannot have a global variable. Hmm. So now to make things pure, I have to pass that global variable around as in locally. Uh, locally. Got it. Okay, and that's kind of you know um, very inconvenient. But if you would make C sharp pure, and you cannot have any side effects, mm -hmm. this is what you would have to do. I would have to pass the whole world around, mm -hmm. and every function would kind of you know would kind of create a new copy conceptually of the world. Um, to, because there cannot be side effects, right? Understood. So, so uh, like taking a sip of your coffee would create a new cup that is kind of a little bit more empty because you cannot have any side effects. So that is kind of you know completely impractical. Absolutely. Okay. And so whenever people start telling me, you know, let's remove side effects from C sharp or Java, I'm telling them, well, if you take that to the extreme, mm -hmm. you will end up with something where you have to pass the whole world around and make copies at every operation that wants to do a side effect. Mm. And that's completely impractical. Absolutely. Now, the thing is what Haskell does is that it says, well, this pattern here, instead of passing this world around, so what really happens is that functions have this type, right? They take arguments and they take the world and they return a result and a new world. Right, mm -hmm. so and this is a copy of the world because that's and but the thing is that this um, another way of writing this is like, you know it, it goes from and this is like a, a higher order function so it takes argument mm -hmm. and it returns a, returns a function that takes the world and then returns a result and the world now this thing you can abbreviate as a arrow i o of r. And you sure that, and you can be sure that that the world is unmodified. Well, and now right? it kind of doesn't matter ah. that the world, because now you make this thing in an abstract type, and now mm -hmm. because you're you can, you have now made this kind of visible in the type, okay. you can implement this by updating the world. But the thing is, by being honest, you can do um, things to the world. You don't have to kind of copy it around because mm -hmm. you know, you know, in the type that this thing. Um, and and uh, has has a uh, the the right type and of course in Haskell you know you you can only combine functions with with this type in a certain way such that you can guarantee that the, that the world is kind of threaded around that you can never have copies so if you can never copy the world mm -hmm. so if if you cannot have your copy of the world and I have mine mm -hmm. then it's safe for me suppose I'm the only one that has a copy of the world I can update it because you cannot observe it. Mm -hmm. But once you can create two copies, now it's unsafe for me to update because now you might observe it or not, so there, there might be some inconsistencies. Hmm. So that, that's kind of the thing. Um, anyway, so this is kind of a quite long-winded story, but what I'm just trying to say is that if you're going for this kind of ultimate purity in a, in, in a language like C Sharp or Java or VB, mm -hmm. you end up in this very unpractical situation where you cannot do anything useful mm -hmm. and you have to kind of thread the kind of world around. Um, and then you have to end up with something like monads. Mm -hmm. um, so that this kind of, you, know, you start here with, with implicit state and you go here and now the state is again implicit but it's kind of now shown in the type. Okay. Okay, so in both cases the state is implicit, only here you're very honest about it, and it's and it's in in the, in the type. Interesting. I mean, you're very honest about it because you're saying the way in which you're computing a result is via I/O. Yes. And that lets you know. I mean, I, I I understand it. It's it's still a little bit confusing because all you're doing is saying this is this is the context of, of how the operation is happening. Yes. But I'm still in the end going to give you an int. Yes. Um, whereas before it was. You don't necessarily know the context of where this is happening. It could be I.O. It could just be a computation inside of the method. I'm still going to give you an in. Yes. So it's still confusing. Well, the thing is here, I know now that 
the difference is, and again, it's it's a difference of pragmatism. Okay. Here, where you know from the type what's going to happen, because there's other effects here. You can here I've, I've kind of drawn all the effects in a big pile. Okay. But you can also have say an exception. This is like the throws clause. You can say this throws an exception or returns an int. Got it. Or you can say sometimes you only want to read an environment variable, say the registry, you only want to read. Mm. So there's a reader monad that returns an int. So you can say it only reads from the environment, but it returns an int. So you can kind of, you know, be more precise about the kind of exceptions that you have here. Whereas here, you're kind of, you know, you're completely imprecise, you never say it. Okay. The thing is that, and, and this is where I say that the, the, the you have to be kind of extreme, there is nothing in the middle, in my view. Hmm. Because you're, either you're completely honest, or you're saying, well, you know, um, I just don't say anything about it. Because mm -hmm. if you say a little bit here, that's still a little bit is the same as nothing. Mm. Um, as, um, I should say, it's like there's nothing such as being half pregnant, right? You're sure. either pregnant or not <laughs> pregnant, but there's nothing like half in between here. Understood. But in the re so, I mean, again, the the I/O really just encapsulates side effects. Exactly. So there could be this number of side effects because this is an I/O operation. Yes. Whereas in the other case. We have no idea what the operation is. You have no idea what the side effects are. Therefore, that affects composability. You know, we can get into that topic a little yes. bit. But I guess my question is: in the programming language, I would argue, um, as an as a former imperative developer, I don't really get to write code anymore. Um, For you. That, that there really is the notion of half pregnancy. I mean, I would argue that lambda expressions in C sharp is half pregnancy. Right? I would argue that link is half pregnancy, the way that you implemented link, link with monads in, in an imperative language, like C-sharp. Isn't that half pregnancy? No. I, I, I would, let's talk about why that's not yes, half okay, pregnancy. Yes, good. So, so, so let, let's talk about lambda expressions. Okay. Right? Um, in some sense, lambda expressions are nothing special. I, I, I kind of tried to explain this um, many times. If you look at, at <laughs> a lambda expression or, or, or a class, uh -huh. A, a class is actually more powerful than a lambda expression. If, if I look at, say, you know, class um, C, mm -hmm. and I have here int f, you know, bool, and say I have here, you know, string g um, button array. Mm -hmm. Okay? What I now have, and there can be some uh, local variables here or fields. What I have now is a package that has two functions in there plus mm -hmm. some local state. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's look what the lambda expression is. A lambda expression is a delegate. Okay. Yes. If if you look into the um, uh, IL spec and you look what is a delegate, it's a class mm -hmm. delegate, and there's multicast delegates and whatever that doesn't really matter. That has a has a, a invoke method. That takes arguments and I don't know. Let's let's just do here, you know, delegates, you know, dr. I, I just make it. You know, it takes a t and returns an r. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and the, the real definition of delegates is is kind of more untyped. It, it 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 has object, but just to say here, so. Delegate is just a special class that has one single method invoke. And now instead of saying delegate dot invoke argument, mm -hmm. since we know that this guy has only one method, we say you can write it like this. Okay, but the C sharp and the VB compiler, if you look at the IL, when you invoke a delegate, it will just call the invoke method. And when you write a lambda expression, when you write X arrow, you know x plus 1, what you're really creating is an instance of this class. So lambda expressions in C-sharp are just a special case of classes. So classes are a superset of lambda expressions. Hmm. Lambda expressions don't give you any extra additional power. And, and especially they don't give you purity. Because I can still have, you know, here, you know, I can have here statements and whatever that have side effects. And even in here, I can return, you know, system dot date time. Mm. So there, lambda expressions are definitely not. So it's dishonest. Um, yes, they're they're kind of, <laughs> but they're they're convenient. So the thing is, dishonest sounds negative, right? Yeah, but we're not. But, it, let's good. But, let's talk about that. Yes, it's but I, I definitely don't mean it to be negative. It sure. just means that the type doesn't tell you what's going on. Mm -hmm. And 
So perhaps a better way that's more politically correct would be pure versus impure. But that right? also sounds, that sounds, um, well, it's pure versus impure. That was this axis, right? Pure okay. versus impure is whether you have side effects or, or, or kind so of... What is, so dishonest means that you, don't, you can't be certain of what... If I look at a type and it promised me an end, it might not be an end. Got it. It might okay. throw an exception or it might do some side effects. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that's the kind of dishonesty there. Interesting. Um, but so lambda expressions are, or I would say classes are more general than lambda expressions. Mm. The thing that lambda expressions give you is closures, right? Is that the fact that I can and closures and um, anonymous, anonymous um, expressions. So the thing is I can write a lambda expression, I can say here int um, y equals 7 and now I can have here you know um, function f equals x x plus y so this guy captures that guy okay. okay so with a lambda expression you can capture things in the outer scope um, now the thing is that you know what if you look at F sharp mm -hmm. and Java, for that matter, you also have the same kind of notion of closures, but for classes. So you can say new, and you can even use this for an interface. You can say new i foo, and then here you can define a method, say f, you know x, and then here I can say return x plus y, where this guy y here. So suppose that the i foo has an f method. So and then here I can say, you know, I foo are, you know, var z equals. Mm -hmm. So you can define, like, in line, I can create a new inner class that also refers to this. And again, these kind of anonymous inner classes are a generalization of lambda expressions because they kind of capture things in the outer scope, so they're kind of closures. Mm. Um, and I like anonymous inner classes a lot because if you're programming with objects, you know, with classes, you want to create things that have kind of, you know, multiple methods and you want to create them just like you, you do lambda expressions. So lambda expressions are not about purity or functional programming. They're about ah. closures. Okay? okay, they're about being able to define inline anonymous things that refer, that capture things that are in the outer scope. And it shouldn't matter whether these things are delegates, which are just special classes that have one method, mm. or interfaces or other classes. Okay. Well, that's a great description because, I mean, that we've been saying for a while that we're seeing the increase in functional constructs inside of C-sharp. So if lambda expressions aren't these functional constructs, what are? Yep. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned another thing, link. Yaha. Okay. Monads. Monads. Well, and there's two aspects to monads. Hmm. Okay, so first of all, monads are some things like when I said, you know, I.O. Uh -huh. of int, that tells you, you know, that this thing returns an int but might have side effects. But there's another aspect of monads too, and that's more like a design pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like when, when I wrote this kind of little piece of code here where I threaded the world around, yeah. that was very painful, right? So what you want to do is you want to kind of, you know, abstract from that or Another example is if you would have exceptions and you would put a try-catch block around each statement that could throw an exception. That's very painful. Yeah. So what monads allow you to do is they give you what is called standard sequence operators in, in link. Is like you have, um, let me give the example, you have select many. That's a, a very good one. It takes an I enumerable of t source and a function from t to i numerable of r f and it returns an i numerable of r. So this is the signature of select many. Okay. Okay, now let's look at this, this signature here, because this guy here, whether this is like I enumerable, that doesn't matter. This can be an, a general monad. So we have in, in, in link, we have I queryable and I enumerable. Okay. Um, but in general, and this is something I also kind of always joke about, 
is in Haskell you can abstract over that so you can here say M and let me put that in red because it's not valid C sharp or VB so in Haskell you can abstract over type constructor Hmm. Um, and in C Sharp and, and Java and whatever, you cannot do that. In C++, I think you can with C++ templates. So this is like you can plug in any kind of type constructor here. And this could be I.O. or whatever. Excellent. And I, this is kind of what Brian often talks about when you want to compose functions that have effects, right? Because this is a function that takes a, a T and has an effect and returns an R. And now if you give me a result of a function that has an effect. Now what this select many does, it kind of executes that thing to, to kind of you know make the effect visible, apparent, grabs the value, passes it to this function, and then the result is something that has an effect as well. Mm. So this guy, the select many, is just a way that encapsulates, so for example, in the, the, the world trending thing, this guy would say, you know, look at this pair of the world and the value, mm -hmm. grab out the value, pass it here, grab out the world, pass it as well, grab the new pair and return it here. So this kind of threading, or with the exceptions, so, so this select many kind of encapsulates, it's like a design pattern hmm. that kind of captures this, what happens if you have this effectful computation. So let me ask you this then, why did you not implement this in C sharp, for example, as a generic type that gets put into the select many. I mean, you said I enumerable and I queryable. Yes. I mean, obviously, it's clear what why link has been created for the data world. I mean, Anders is big on making data programming easier for uh, general purpose programmers. But let's talk about that. Did, did, is, is there thinking about? It? Is it? Does, does the question make any sense that I just asked yeah. you? How's that? So, so there's, there's two. So a lot of people, because it says here I enumerable yeah. and I queryable, think mm -hmm. that link is only useful for data. Mm -hmm. But there's actually, Don Syme has a very nice blog entry where he talks about first class events. Mm -hmm. um, because an event is like an example of a monad here. You can define all the standard sequence operators on this. Um, asynchronous programming. Is, is an example of this. So if you look at in F sharp the asynchronous workflows, they are using the same mechanism here. Yeah. Um, the reason that we didn't do this, where we didn't par parameterize over the type constructor, that's a limitation of the CLR. Ah, um, okay. and, and, that's, um, and, and again, there's a lot of technical reasons. Once you do this, um, you have to be careful. And I can give a little example. So suppose that we have this, and now we know that this M takes a single type parameter. Okay. Right? So now I cannot, and let me just use black again, I cannot call select many and say I now, um, suppose I have a class um, hash table that takes key comma value, um, right? I cannot now pass hash table here with say int and string. Right, because a hash table is something that takes two parameters, mm. and this guy expects one parameter. So it's kind of, you know, doing, you suddenly now have to do a lot of type checking as well um, using these guys. So yeah, you have to have what is called a kind system. So mm. the, the, the kind of this guy would be, it takes a type and a type, and it returns a type. So mm. it takes two types, and it returns that people use kind of stars for this. Mm. Whereas the kind of this guy takes one type and returns one type. So you would get not a type error in this case, if I do this, mm -hmm. but you would get a kind error. <laughs> so now you kind of people's brains probably already That's starting a cool to name. explode. I like that. Yes. Um, a kind error. A kind error. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that's the kind of the reason why we didn't do that. Okay. But to come back to your question, mm -hmm. why link is kind of again not half pregnant, because link uses monads not to deal with side effects but to encapsulate these design patterns mm. so that you can, you know, if you, if you would kind of unfold all the select manys and so on into the underlying C sharp, you would see this kind of, you know, a very kind of verbose pattern that you could write by hand. And link kind of abstracts from that and that's why it's called also a pattern. And mm. you look in the C sharp or VB language specification, it's the same as a for each loop. Right, the for each loop says if your class implements this um, 
these interfaces or these methods, then you know you can write a for each loop and it's expanded in in a certain pattern. Okay. So so link again, it doesn't introduce this notion of monads for side effects. It uses in, it uses monads to encapsulate a design pattern. Okay. Um, so again, I would say it's kind of you know not in the middle here. So I mean, but that's a really incredibly that's an important point because you know. C sharp is very side effectful. Yep. By design. Yes, and I think that's people good. People want to do things. Yes. Yeah. So the thing is, here's the thing. It's the sad thing, right? Uh -huh. That people are trying to. Um, well, maybe. You, uh, well, can you beep out uh, words from the tape? You don't need to. You can curse as long as you don't say the really bad ones. Okay. So if you castrate the language, it sure, doesn't get. To, okay. Yeah. You never know, right? Sure. Fair enough. Um, if you castrate the language, it doesn't get more powerful, right? You're chopping off parts, mm -hmm. like saying you cannot use side effects, but your language never gets more powerful by removing features. Yes. And this is the lesson from why functional programming matters um, in 1984, mm -hmm. right? Is a language doesn't get more powerful by removing features, you have to add features. And so that is where functional languages, pure functional languages shine, is because they add lazy evaluation and higher order functions. Mm -hmm. So that is something if removing and monads. So removing side effects doesn't help you anything because you're just removing things. So now you can do less. All right. So what if you added um, higher order functions and these pure constructs to C sharp and let the C sharp developer decide that this class, this public publicly shared encapsulated blob of, of useful state and useful functionality is going to be pure, okay? okay? Such that you can always be guaranteed that everything in here, you can guarantee what they're going to return to you. You can, you can expect um, a wonderful world and you can compose on top of it. Is that just uh, uh, impossible? Okay, so, so now you're, 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 you're asking a good question. It's like what happens if we, can we deal with a pure subset? Can we tell, you know, something is pure? Mm -hmm. The problem there is that you can, these things, purity is not something that's compositional. Um, because if mm -hmm. I have something that's pure, then you know it's kind of it it it, it, it remains pure, right? But once I do something that's impure, mm -hmm. this thing kind of becomes impure itself. So everything that uses it becomes impure. It's the same. Why, if you read, um, why I think. I can quote Anders on this, but when he says why C Sharp doesn't have Dros class, mm -hmm. it's exa exactly because of that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, once, once you use a Dros class, mm -hmm. then everything that uses that method has to have a Dros class too, because it becomes impure. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that why a lot of people also don't like Haskell, mm -hmm. because once you have something here that uses I.O., mm -hmm. that thing has become impure, and now everything that uses it becomes impure. Okay. And now assume that you start with a pure program, right? It's all pure. Mm -hmm. And now you need a little bit of a side effect somewhere mm -hmm. that makes I.O. Now your whole program changes because that, that impurity kind of spreads. Okay, but, but, I would ask, but I would say this. You're, you're talking about uh, impurity from the, from the language sense, I mean, from the conceptual sense, I get that. But on the other hand, it's honest. Because if I Im make my my program impure because I state that that I'm that I'm going to do some fun you know some things that are going to return you know in the context of I/O that's actually honest. Yes. So so the so thing is what you're doing what what you're proposing but now you get into the same world as Haskell mm -hmm. only the defaults are reversed right it's in Haskell everything is pure by default mm -hmm. and you say when it's not pure. You can reverse that and you can say, you know, things are impure by default and you're saying that it's, and, and you're saying that it's pure, mm -hmm. but now really there, there's no difference with, with the other system, right? You, what I'm saying, you have to be honest and you have to mm -hmm. be explicit, mm -hmm. but the same things happens. If you're now saying that something is pure mm -hmm. and you want to do something that's impure, now the whole thing crashes down. So this notion of purity mm -hmm. and impurity are not compositional okay. because as soon as you're doing something impure mm -hmm. inside something pure everything it, it like it, it's a little bit like generics mm -hmm. where if you want to make something generics down here then this guy must be generic and then you have to pass the type parameter 
parameter here. So it kind of it has to go all the way up. It's kind of not compositional. Okay. So and again, so that's just either and you end up with something very similar to Haskell, hmm. where it's just the other way around. Okay. Um, and then I would say that it's better to be the opposite, better to be the Haskell way, because there are many different side effects, and there's only one kind of purity. You see what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. there's I.O., there's exceptions, mm -hmm. you might read. So Haskell allows you to distinguish between all kinds of impurity. Mm -hmm. But there's only one kind of purity. So if you want to make this, this difference explicit, mm -hmm. I would say make it explicit in the most expressive way, where you can distinguish between all these different kind of shades of gray. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying it's pure or it's impure, okay. but there's no no variations of, of purity, hmm. um, and people might argue. Well, you might say this is like a little bit impure, but now you're kind of switching already to that side. So I mean, this of course all begs the question because in the real world, uh, where people are building applications uh, that are large. Uh, with shared libraries and libraries that the developer doesn't necessarily write him or herself and that they're getting from all over the place. But anyway, to make a so you're going to have UI if it's an yep. expressive app that does something for yep. a customer. Yep. Um, is there the notion, is there the possibility of like of architecting your application where you would use the pure sort of Haskell approach in a subset of, of its classes and a subset of its libraries? And then you could do the impure stuff in say for UI, yep. right? And for this person is going to add, you know, going to interact with my app, but the app actually could be constructed maybe in its core in a very pure way. I mean, is that, let's talk about, you know, the future uh, of, for developers. I mean, let's, let's talk about where this stuff, because no one's going to actually start programming Haskell to write Windows apps, right? Let's be honest. Yeah, but, but so, so this is the kind of, you know, again, and this is the tension, right? It's like, it's pragmatism versus purity. So if you're, if you really want to kind of, you know, be, know everything about your program, mm -hmm. and like, for example, the thing that I, that I told you here, right, yeah. is that the example where I said, you, you know, where, where I, I replaced, you know, some expression here that was duplicated mm -hmm. um, with, you know, let x equals expression in x comma x these are ex exactly the kinds of transformations that you want to do when you're running on a many core system or in parallel because what this says is it doesn't matter if i execute this guy once mm -hmm. or whether i kind of distribute the execution and you know do it separate because maybe this one is is executed on two different cores right and it might be cheaper to kind of just let them run in parallel than to kind of compute it first and because there's now a bottleneck here because mm -hmm. there could be you know f of this and g of this right and now i can just run them in parallel absolutely so so i think if you really want to leverage kind of parallelism and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff you have to go to this completely pure world and um, but again if you want to write a ui and other things mm -hmm. you it's convenient to be impure and these these worlds actually kind of uh, at a slightly higher level mm -hmm. um, interface quite well because from Haskell you can call into the impure world and everything looks like IO hmm. from the impure world I can call into Haskell because everything just looks like you know you just ignore that hmm. um, and so so it kind of works fine but it's like within each 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 kind of sandbox mm -hmm. you know exactly um, where you are absolutely um, and so the developer is going to have to be able to... I mean, the, the confusion, of course, is that when you think about the advent of uh, managed libraries, like the CCR, I mean, the CCR has so much concurrency, it, it's, it's pretty much ridiculous. And it's a, it's a somewhat cumbersome programming model, but it's, it's, it's still pretty interesting and will definitely work in a multi-core scenario uh, and pure C-sharp. The second thing is the parallel FX. Yep. Right. So that's purely C sharp, and you're calling things like parallel dot four, and you throw in a lambda expression. Uh, let, let, but, but that's very interesting yep. because you aren't really writing that what you just wrote on the board impli uh, explicitly. Do you understand? Well, or is that not true? Well, the, here here's the kind of the catch. But there's two catches there. Uh -huh. If you look at um, um, like the parallel for loop, uh -huh. right? The thing that you're doing there is you know you're passing this lambda expression and you're running them in parallel. 
but these lambda expressions, you know, can have arbitrary side effects and so on. Um, but often, so so there's kind of you know, a little bit of weirdness. Okay. But the other thing is that you're talking about concurrency, mm -hmm. but actually spinning up a thread is is a very very powerful side effect. So let me give you an example here uh -huh. where I use um, C omega notation, uh -huh. um, but you can do the same in Erlang or whatever, where you can simulate using threads, you can simulate mutable state. Mm -hmm. So it looks at, so now I can ban out all assignments from my for my language, but if you allow threads, I can still do side effects. Okay. And this is the other thing where, where I fear when people say, let's remove assignments. Mm. If you leave a little bit of other side effects, you can always simulate mutable state. So mm. it's kind of, it's like, you know, you're, 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 you're killing this kind of weeds, mm -hmm. but then other weeds still grow. So you either eliminate all side effects or you embrace all side effects. There is no nothing in between. Mm -hmm. side, with one side effect, you can usually simulate another. So let me show you okay. that. So, and again, I'm, I'm using um, um, C omega notation here, which should be easy to, to understand. So I'm going to define cell of, cell of T. Okay, and what it has, it has here a method that returns a T get and I, I let me write down the code and then explain it mm -hmm. return So what is, uh, does it fit on the screen? Yeah. So what this defines is a cell, and it's parameterized by T. Okay. And it has two methods. So this one is synchronous, and this can be asynchronous. Okay. And then it it has a kind of private message in here that it kind of sends to itself, and this message re retains the state. If you look at Erlang, this is the way in Erlang. Um, objects are encoded. Objects are encoded by a thread that has a tail recursive loop that kind of you know maintains its state. Okay. So what happens if I get the current state, if I ask to get the current state, this guy can execute if both of these methods have been called. So in the constructor you call value with with null or something. So if if somebody calls get and there's a value t, what you do is you send yourself that value. So this is like the tail recursive call, and you return the t to the caller. Hmm. Okay. If you want to set a value, a new value, well, if the old value was t, you now send yourself this message with the new value, and you return. Okay. Okay. So what you're really doing is in in your own message queue for hmm. the thread, you keep your current state, and so it's like you know, I, I, it's like a process that can get, you know, get and set messages and then to itself it sends this value message. Okay. Okay, and when there's a get and a value it will kind of, you know, do that and when there's a set and and this one is like a private thing. But there, there's no assignments here, right? Mm -hmm. There's no assignment. I'm just sending messages. Okay. But I'm using the message queue of this thread to keep the state. So if you give me threads, mm -hmm. I can implement mutable state. So now you say, okay, I remove all assignments. I have this class here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I can define a class C that has here a cell of int x, and this can be read only. Okay, so there's no assignments. I cannot change this x, mm -hmm. but I can now say, you know c dot x dot set 5. So now even though I don't have any assignments, mm -hmm. I've simulated mutable state using threads. Okay, so and this is what, what and so you have gained nothing. I've just made it more cumbersome for people to use mutable state, mm -hmm. but there's still mutable state. Okay. 
So, so whenever people, I get scared when people say, let's remove assignments from C sharp, because with one effect you can simulate another. If you, or even simpler, right? If you don't remove console dot read line, console dot write line, I can with console dot read line, console dot write line, I can simulate mutable state because I just you know, ask you for to give you the next value, mm -hmm. right? Or I pipe it, or I write it to a file and read it. So, once you leave a little bit of effect in your in your mm -hmm. language, you can still do mutable state. Excellent. Um, so let's embrace. Let's side embrace effect. side effects. Exactly. Yes. Side effects are good. Yes, they are. And the nice thing about objects is that they encapsulate side states and side effects. So we should not throw that away. We're throwing away the baby with the bathwater. We, well, we don't want to throw it away. Who wants to throw it away? Nobody does, right? Oh, you know, you, 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 you go in the blogosphere, everybody's yeah. talking about functional programming, meaning mm -hmm. removing assignments. I that see. is not functional programming. Functional programming is programming with pure functions, which means that these functions are honest and show in their types the effects. Mm -hmm. um, and these kind of semi-functional languages, like F sharp, are extremely valuable because they introduce things like closures, right? Mm -hmm. Like where you can kind of capture things and they make, in some sense, they make programming with side effects easier. Sure, but they're not purely functional. But they're not purely functional. Okay. And, and that is the kind of, you know, the kind of message. And yes, you, you're programming in a higher order style mm -hmm. with closures, but mm -hmm. that's very different in my view mm -hmm. from functional programming, which has a very precise meaning, is programming with mathematical functions. Okay. Which means that every time I call the thing with the same argument, it must return the same result. Outstanding. So, well, that's why we, we have these uh, interviews with yes. to clear up this confusion. Yes. Thank you again for your time, Eric. Okay, you're uh, most welcome. And we will absolutely talk to you again. I just wanted to pan a little bit since we're in okay. your office here. Um, do you have enough, uh, you know, patents, or do you need more? Oh, that, that's my hobby. So you know, I, I'm. Uh, that's cool. I'm working on more. So you got a lot of patents here. Yep. Um, for Microsoft. That's right. And. Uh, uh, yeah, that's there's some of my kind of awards. And this is my favorite um, DW. And I said, you know, I used to be a hacker. Um, yeah. And I tried to kind of, you know, hack on these two, that guy as well. But Which one is this? The, the, the Arthur here. Arthur. Oh, it's 11.07 in the morning on Tuesday, December 11th, 2007. To hear what I'm thinking, squeeze my ear. So wow. that's kind of the things that I like to play with, you know, to kind of, you know, hook things. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know this magazine, Make? Make magazine? Yes, I do know it very uh, that's, well. Uh, I love that, you know, these kind of the things I, I try to do, you know, in my spare time. Outstanding. So, so you hacked Arthur. Yes. Very cool. Okay. Well, hey, take care, Eric. Okay. Talk to you See soon. See you. Bye-bye. See you.